his childhood city. A boy runs along the narrow streets of an adobe brick city. He is seven years old, but he is fiercely independent. He must reach the caravanserai. There, for just two copper fells, a wandering philosopher will allow him to look upon a strange book concerning Aladdin, the magic bird Ruh, and Caliph Harun al-Rashid. He dashes through the market square, passing the fruit and spice merchants. The caravan leaves in five days. He desperately wants to know how such tales are born. As he sprints through the streets of his native city, he naturally has no idea of the amazing life he will lead. The boy will become a scientist, Abu Nasser Muhammad al-Farabi. What hides behind the walls of this ancient city? Abu Nasser al-Farabi was born in the town of Vesij, which is near Otra. Where do the legends lead? His father was an officer in the military. How can a person's name help uncover their fate? His biography is based on various legends, accounts and hypotheses. He wanted to know how fairy tales were born and his own life has become a legend. Scientist, poet, musician, Al-Farabi and the city he grew up in. Chapter 1. What does my name reveal to you? A house consists of four parts. Husband and wife, master and servant, parent and child, property and owner. He who controls these parts unites them so that they help each other to achieve a common goal, to fill the house with good. That person is the ruler of the house and in that house he plays the same role as the ruler of a city, Al-Farabi. Al-Farabi's life is shrouded in mystery, based mostly on legend and assumption. Only his name and a few dates are more or less reliable. He was born in the year 870 and died in the year 950. A person's name carries information about certain family traditions and the world within them. Abu Nasr Muhammad ibn Muhammad ibn Tarhan ibn Uslak al-Farabi al-Turki. Abu Nasr is a philosophical concept, the father of faith, victory, or poetry, but it may simply mean father of Nasr. He probably had a son. One way or another, this part of the name appeared later. At the time of his birth, the future philosopher was named Muhammad. And judging by his name, his father was Muhammad also. His father was an officer in the military. It seems that the scientist's father belonged to the Turkic aristocracy, as evidenced by the name of his grandfather, Tarhan. Translated from Turkic, it denotes the title chief or commander. Uslag is the name of his great-grandfather. The Nizba al-Farabi speaks of the place of his birth. In Arabic names, a nisba is an adjective that indicates a place of origin. Farab refers to Otra, which was located beyond the Sir Darya River. Incidentally, according to one version, that's why the name is Farab, beyond the river. And this is not only the name of the city. Farab is the name of a district whose length and width is less than one day's journey. It has fortifications and forts. This country has alkaline soil swamps and crops to the west of the Farab River, Abu i Qasim ibn Hawqal, Roads and Countries. It was, as academician Bernstein put it, a most convenient and most dangerous place, attractive to conquerors throughout history at the crossroads of trade routes, full of life. The most common image that springs to mind of a Middle Eastern city is that of camels and caravans, and there were many of these. There were also numerous settlements at this crossroads, an incredible number. At the Otra Oasis, which, on the whole, is not especially large, at 50 square kilometers. 
Many settlements of the Otrar oasis and nearby cities were founded in the middle of the first millennium. The biggest incentive for the development of urban civilization was the Great Silk Road. By the end of the millennium, these places were controlled by the Arab Caliphate. Arab tribes, believing in a new religion, came to the region from the Arabian Peninsula. The second half of the 9th century, after a decade of coup d'etat and turmoil, another descendant of the famous Harun al-Rashid, al-Mutamid, came to power in the Arab Caliphate. He granted the representative of the Persian dynasty of the Samanids the title of rulers of Mavaranar. The governor took up residence in Samarkand. Nevertheless, all this was one state, the Arab Caliphate. An Arab geographer traveled to these places a century after the birth of Al-Farabi. He was one of the first to tell the world about the scientist's homeland. Vesij also belongs to the Farab district. Abu Nasr al-Farabi, the author of books on logic, which explain the work of the ancient philosophers, the greatest authority in the science, came from this city, Abu Iqasim ibn Hawqal, Roads and Countries. Abu Nasr al-Farabi was born in Vesij, which is near Otrar. The ruins of the ancient city of Vesij are also that of the fortress of Oxus. It can be found on the route from Samarkand in the Akshar tract, nine and a half kilometers from the village of Mayakum and 20 kilometers from Otrar. It is presumed that the city was founded in the 8th century AD, a century before the birth of Al-Farabi. We know this city was founded here and that from there it reached out to the wider world and to wider science. But how can one see the city that once existed behind these neatly cleared excavations, drawings and diagrams? The city of his childhood, what was it like? What family was he born into? What age did he live in? Chapter 2 from childhood. Where the Aris River flows into the Sir Darya, the fortress walls stand. The ruler there is Muhammad. He is menacing, but righteous. Do not offer any gifts to him to ingratiate yourself. If you value your head, be honest with him and do not look upon his wife shamelessly, for he will not forgive it. For though his wife is not a great beauty, once you look upon her, your heart will warm." From an ancient legend. At that time, it was mainly the Turkic tribes of Karluks, Oguzes and Kipchaks that lived in the Farab district. Many of them were given plots of land, and they protected the northern borders of the Caliphate from raids. It is generally assumed that Al-Farabi was born into a military family that were members of one of these tribes. This is a subject of much debate, but at the same time, there must be some specific written sources to rely upon. No specific written sources survive. There is only a single mention. At that time, in principle, religious affiliation, say, for example, I am a Muslim or I am a Shiite, I am Sunni, was much more important back then than ethnicity. Judging by his name, Muhammad, his father was a Muslim. Judging by the period, the scientist's grandfather did not profess Islam. Travelers told of the small town of Vesij, where there lived a powerful emir. It was built on the principles of other medieval Middle Eastern cities, the citadel, the Shahistan, the Rabat, and the fortress walls. Shahistan is the Persian word for Shah, an Iranian city. Fortified within the walls of the tower and outside the Shahistan, there was, as a rule, a Rabat. This was a suburb for craftsmen and tradesmen. 
There were also shacks for poor people and workshops for artisans and small and medium scale merchants. This is the image of the city during a later period, the Golden Horde. However, according to scientists, little had changed in four centuries. Houses were also built of adobe brick and the streets were just as narrow. And where are we now? What is this? It's just an ordinary quarter, specifically an artisan quarter. Most likely, yes, because there are such narrow streets and behind it is something that's more similar to trading posts. At that time, the city was a military fortress and the father of the future scientist was allegedly the head of the Citadel Guard or perhaps a prison guard. Another possibility is that he led a detachment of the equestrian Turkic Guard. Other data also exists. His father was the ruler of that city. In the siege, archaeologists found the ruins of a palace complex of 12 rooms. It is possible that the future scientist was born in one of them. Emirs and aristocrats lived in relatively large and beautiful houses. Perhaps this was home to a powerful emir whose name has been lost to history. As for Al-Farabi's mother, her name is unknown. It's also unclear how many brothers or sisters he had. But one thing is sure, the boy was not born into a poor family and apparently spent most of his childhood in the citadel. The citadel, in Russian, the Kremlin, the place where the ruler of the city lived, epicenter of all political and economic power the focus of all the institutions of state. Incidentally, in the 13th century, the city bore a completely different name. And to some extent, this will help us understand what it was like during the time of Al-Farabi. Yerevan. Matanadaran is a repository of ancient manuscripts. Another mention of the city comes from the traveling court of the Armenian king Hetum I, who stopped there to rest. In this manuscript, the place is referred to as Zernuk. This is another name for a sakia, a wheel that lifts water. Perhaps such a structure existed here if the city was named after it. Unique irrigation facilities were not uncommon at that time. There were fountains, and with the help of irrigation installations, water flowed from one arik to another. Excavations of Visij confirm that water was taken from the head arik, ak arik. Archaeologists discovered evidence for this in the ruins. Agriculture was impossible here without artificial irrigation. Therefore, we see the remains of powerful canals. Here is a small body of water with a sakia installation. There were always people around because, as you understand, here in the steppe, water is the source of life. So there was a constant flow of people. Life was in full swing here. They exchanged news and they brought their horses and other animals to water. Water was collected here for domestic use and the latest news was naturally shared here. The regular splashing of water near the sakia, the clatter of hooves on the cobblestones, the inviting calls of the merchants in the bazaar, the sounds of his native city remain forever in his memory, of course, and the stern look of his father, the clinking of his dagger, the smell of rose oil from his mother's hands and the lingering songs of the foreign slave woman that served as his nanny. But Farab's city was most likely remembered in a completely different way. The sound of the call to prayer, the unfamiliar language of foreign merchants, the rustle of pages of ancient and not so ancient books. This city changed the boy's fate. Where did the future scientist study? What were his first teachers like? What did Al-Farabi look like? 
Chapter 3 Youth in Otrar A man cannot be endowed by nature with virtue or vice, just as he cannot be born a weaver or a scribe, but he may be predisposed to conditions that prompt him more likely to one action than another. Al Farabi The boy received his initial education at Vesij. The first teacher of Al Farabi, most likely, was his mother. The children remained in the female half of the house until the age of seven. An important part of this training was the Bismillah ceremony. When the child was four years, four months, and four days old, he had to read several verses from the Quran. Al-Farabi was very bright from an early age. As a rule, knowledge was passed on from parents to children. Interestingly, the majority of the caliphate was literate. There were religious schools and libraries of sacred texts, but they were only attended by the children of merchants and artisans. The feudal elite preferred to educate their children themselves, inviting teachers to their homes. So the first education Al-Farabi received was at home. Muhammad was lucky. He was born at a time when war had subsided and the various empires had already determined their borders and spheres of influence. The region has become dominated by Arab culture. Standing next to such a vessel, you can't help imagining that a genie might come out of it. So of course, you give it a rub. It's just a tale of Shahrazad. The Golden Age of Arab Culture The main character of the Arabian tales is a merchant. The supporting characters are a military leader and a scientist. In general, these are the priorities that are set. The Arabic language and Arabic script were spread through Islam. It was a time of internal development of the country. As a result, knowledge and skills were highly valued. People who could express their thoughts eloquently and write well were especially appreciated. The art of rhetoric was like a beautiful necklace made up of rare pearls of speech, they said. Al-Farabi was, apparently, a capable student. He knew his version of the Turkic language very well. He knew Arabic, Farsi, and other languages. How old was he when he moved to Farab? Between 10 and 15 years old. Some historians believe that his father was promoted, that he became the commander-in-chief of the entire district, or maybe the boy was simply sent there to receive further education. Literacy was developed in the cities, where there were many literate people. The city was also the center of intellectual, spiritual, and cultural life, material and spiritual enrichment. One did not interfere with the other. In fact, the opposite was true. Religion and science, alongside spices and jewels, spread throughout the Silk Road. All this could not help but affect this open-minded and inquisitive young man. He quite literally drew knowledge on the street. While studying in a madrasa as a child, he wanted to learn astronomy, the stars, every phenomenon on Earth. It all began with this. But did he study at a madrasa? The first mention of such an educational institution dates back to the 10th century, which was in Bukhara. In Samarkand, madrasas appeared a century later. There were no such schools in the 9th century. The children studied either in the teacher's house or in the trading post, but most often in the mosque itself. As a rule, a mosque was located in the market square and all political and social life was concentrated there. Farabi City Center As an illustration to the tales of Shahrazad, the woolen blue cloak of a dervish, full of holes and patches, the silk kaftan of a Byzantine merchant, the bright turban of an Indian dignitary. Shoes can also tell you a lot. high heel sandals are worn by slaves. Free caliphate citizens walked in Morocco-style shoes with curled-up toes, without backs. Instead of socks, they simply wore a second pair. But black leather boots, these clearly originated in Turkey. 
The cities were filled with diverse sounds and noise. Well, firstly, because the main focus of the city was the bazaar, and in the bazaar one could hear any language, especially if it was a large commercial city. They say that it was at bazaars and local fairs that original poetry competitions were held, and that this was where the speakers honed their art. And here, in the marketplace, the best students were honored. For example, a teenager sat on a donkey, drove along the nearby streets, and his comrades showered him with sweets. The less well-behaved students were punished. It's worth noting that corporal punishment was only permitted for children over the age of 10, and no more than three strokes at a time. Moreover, the older students were not allowed to beat the younger ones. They studied six days a week, except for Friday. They studied Muslim law, theology, verse, logic, mathematics, and rhetoric. It was a big city, according to the scholars of the time. There was a large market and mosque, and there was a large library. The young man of short stature carries a scroll and reed sticks in his hands. He follows a familiar path. He is dressed soundly, but not pretentiously. It is known that Al-Farabi usually wore a traditional Arabic costume in the form of a floor-length robe, complemented by a large headscarf. He preferred Turkic clothes, a dressing gown and pants. They say that he also rode well and was a perfect shot with the bow. This is not surprising. If his father was a soldier, he probably taught his son many of these skills from childhood. Some historians refer to him as a warrior, though it is not clear why. There are no references to him serving in any army. There is very little factual evidence because his biography is based on various legends, accounts and hypotheses. Silent and smiling, his character is soft, but stubborn, restrained, dreamy, and there is an inner fire in him, modest, unpretentious, tireless in study, and diligent. His acquaintances would likely describe the future scientist this way. From early on, he was referred to as a teacher. But who was his mentor? What books did he read? And what instruments did he play? Epilogue, the path of the teacher. It is not common for every person to know happiness and things that should be known at the same time. This often requires a teacher and a mentor, Al-Farabi. Al-Farabi, of course, had teachers and mentors in his native land. It is simply that the history of their names has not been preserved. According to legend, it was in Otrar that he first began to read the books of the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle. But someone must have given him these books. Another legend is that, allegedly, in his hometown, he took music and singing lessons from a wandering musician and became very adept. They say that crowds often gathered as he accompanied himself with a two-stringed kipchik that he had made himself. Al-Farabi is the author of a treatise on music. He knew music perfectly, as well as medicine, philosophy, and philology. The foundations of much of his knowledge were laid in Otrar, and he seemed to have no shortage of teachers. We must show the world of that time in a different light. It was indeed a time of darkness, but it was also the dawn of science and education. Beautiful poetry was created in the era of the Muslim Renaissance. Poetry and fairy tales. Of course, the works of Aristotle were not Al-Farabi's first books. Most likely, this was the Quran, and amongst the others, quite possibly was A Thousand and One Nights which was very popular in the 9th century. Scribes recorded the many stories of Shahrazad from the dictation of storytellers, and there was a huge demand for these manuscripts. 
he wanted to know how such stories came to be. What he did not know was that over the years, his own story would become such a wandering fairy tale.